There we go. Okay. Going live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to the shop. Um, yeah, you can't see me because I am over here. <laughs> We are going to have a little bit of fun tonight. My wife isn't back yet. We're starting this one early because we have a special guest. We have Owen Reardon all the way from Ireland. So, uh, okay. yeah, say hi. How's it going, guys? <laughs> oh, I got to put my headphone in so I can actually hear him. Um, it'd be better if I could do that, too. Um, so... Before we get into all that, we're going to do the, uh, the regular things. If you are new to the channel, um, on the live every Tuesday, we take the first couple minutes and talk about upcoming things, kind of news in the woodworking world. Um, so we have several events happening. Um, number one, in just a couple weeks, June 14th through the 17th, Green Bay, Wisconsin, we have the National MWTCA Meet. This is the largest antique tool sale in the world. Um, and there are two of these a year in the United States. So um, stay tuned. The first one is... 14th of June, 14th through 17th. Um, next one is going to be in uh, July. I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. That one is, um, that's a um, oh, Potomac, what do they call it? Patina. That's another uh, tool group there. Uh, so July 16th, just outside of Washington, D.C. If you want to see these, I have links to all of them down in the description. Next one, July 29th. Um, Greenworks, it sounds like it's going to be canceled, so I may end up going to um, Florida, down to Kissimmee. Uh, um, and there is an MWTCA meet that will be there on July 29th. Next one is Handworks. If you go to one event at the whole year, Handworks. It's a two-day event in Amana, Iowa. The entire town is dedicated to hand tools. They have all of the makers of modern. They have antique tool sellers. The entire town is de uh, devoted to demonstration, and you actually get to play with any tool you want. Um, all of the, um, the, the, the big names in Wood World will be there. It's absolute fun. Uh, Rex and I will actually be doing a, uh, a hangout on one of the days. We haven't decided when. Um, but stay tuned. If you want to, it's the one to go to, and it's completely free. You just have to show up. But if you do sign up ahead of time, you get entered for door prizes. Um, next one is September 16th, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'll be down there for another MWTCA meet. And then uh, September 28th through the 30th is in Des Moines, Iowa, and that is the other national MWTCA meet. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing any of you at those. So, there's all the news, um, but today we're actually over here talking with Owen Reardon. So, how's it going, man? Pretty good, yeah. The sun is shining here in Ireland for the right. first time in a long time, so... It's shining at 11 p.m.? Not anymore, but, you know, the days are about 20 degrees um, <laughs> the past week, which is very unusual. 20, that's got to be, what, 73, something like that? Sounds Probably nice. cold for you guys, is it? Uh, no, that's actually on the hot side here. Okay. Um, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's the reason we're doing this at 5 p.m. today, because it's currently 11 p.m. his time. So, um, yeah, thank you for being flexible and willing, willing to be up late. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, so, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, what, what is it that you do? Well, um, my name is Owen Reardon, and I suppose I'd uh, classify myself as a traditional woodworker uh, from County Cork in Ireland. Uh, I'd probably be most well known for my uh, tool restoration videos on TikTok. Um, I've kind of been woodworking now for maybe two, three years uh, with a big, you know, enthusiasm and emphasis on traditional hand uh, woodworking tools. So yeah, I suppose in summary, that's who I am and what I do. <laughs> so what what is your, your full-time business? Is it uh, woodworking or content oh, that's, that's a funny one. Um, I was in college studying commerce, uh, and I completed two years of that. Um, but since I gained a bit of traction online last year, I, I said I'd take this year out of college. So I suppose, yeah, I'm a full-time content creation, but I will be going back to college in September. Um, I would still like to keep the content creation going on the side to a lesser extent, but yeah, I suppose at the minute, uh, I'm a content creator, whether I like it or not. So you, you continuing with the, the same degree? I don't like the degree, but I think it's better to just do two more years and get that done than start a whole other course yeah. that'll take me four years, you know? Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. I, my, my undergrad was in counseling, my master's okay. was in technical theater, and now I'm a YouTuber, so. <laughs> yeah. 
there's no way of knowing really where life will take you. Yeah. So uh, you, you've only been woodworking for two years or has it been something you kind of grew up in or? Not really, no. Um, both my parents are accountants. Um, we didn't really have any kind of woodworker in the family. Um, what got me into woodworking was, I suppose, uh, throughout secondary school, I suppose, would that be high school over there? Um, I'd always wanted to build a curruck, which um, is, an, is a traditional Irish boat. They're usually about 20 odd feet long and they're built using like as little wood as possible. So I'd always wanted to make one of those. And then when lockdown kicked in, um, I said I'd actually go about doing it. So, you know, I don't come from a woodworking background, so we didn't have any, you know, workshop or power tools or anything fancy like that. Um, so I went on, I suppose, done deal, which would be our version of Craigslist or whatever for you guys. Um, and I didn't have a lot of money to be buying any nicer tools. So I was buying rusty old hand tools, fixing them up and then using them to build a boat. But I suppose that was my gateway drug into woodworking. Once I had the boat done, I was kind of obsessed with all these hand tools. I was devouring content by the likes of yourself, Paul Sellers, Rex Kruger. Um, and yeah, about maybe two years into this obsession, I turned the camera on myself on TikTok. And in a matter of weeks, it just kind of snowballed into I think a couple of hundred thousand followers. So, yeah, that that's been my journey. I was I was actually kind of funny because my my mother, uh, I was talking to her a couple of weeks ago when I set up the interview with her. And I was like, yeah, we're we're getting an uh, Owen Reardon, and she's like, oh, is 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 he that Irish guy? I don't know what he's making, but I love listening to him. <laughs> really? Hide your mother's arts. What's that? Hide your mother's. Yeah. yeah, my wife just got here, so um, she'll be monitoring the, the chat. So if anyone has questions uh, for Owen, throw those in the chat, and Sarah will organize those once she has a chance to. Um, I don't know if I have her camera up tonight, so. That's okay. They don't need to see. Not a bad thing, because she just got off work, so. <laughs> um, yeah, you got the headphones good. Um, sorry, I threw myself off track. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Kurok. Uh, that is that was fascinating so it, it's with a a, a cowhide yeah well that's um so the uh, you might be thinking of the caracal i built that maybe a few uh, weeks ago with a friend he's a basket maker and we decided we pool our you know our knowledge i'm a woodworker he's a basket maker so that's essentially like a basket traditionally it would have been made out of hazel we couldn't get our hands on any so we used willow um but yeah it's essentially a boat uh, that would have been used to navigate rivers and to waterproof this basket, they would have stretched an animal hide, probably a cow hide, over it. Um, so the curruck is kind of the evolution of the coracle. Um, coracles aren't much good for going out to sea. Um, the currucks are usually longer. They kind of look like canoes, uh, and they're they're seagoing vessels. You know, they're able to handle the waves. And um, about 200 years ago, instead of covering them with animal skins, you stretch canvas over them and paint them in tar. And nowadays, they're still being made, except uh, people put fiberglass on them. So. <laughs> that was about it. That, that, that's actually fascinating. It makes me want to. Uh, it'd be fun to make. Do something. Yeah, like I'm going to make another one over summer. Hopefully now. Um, well, maybe not this summer, but one of the summers. I have a pipe dream that I'm going to roll one of them around the whole country one day. Huh. So stay tuned. Well, that's, that sounds like fun. That's right. You just uh, you got a uh, um, uh, what is that? A Honda Fifty. Uh, 170. 70. Slightly more horsepower. <laughs> that, that, that sounds like a... What are you planning on doing with that? Uh, well, there's um, a Honda Run happening on the 8th of July coming. Where there's, um, it's for charity, but we're basically riding them from Mizzenhead to Malinhead, which is the southernmost tip of Ireland, all the way up to the northernmost tip. It's about 600 kilometers, and we're doing it all in the one day, starting at 4 in the morning, and just <laughs> keep on going until we get there. If we get there, fingers crossed. Touch wood. <laughs> so are you then going to turn around and ride back, or are you going to haul it back? I'm not too else? sure what the plan is. If that is the case, I'll probably take a few pit stops on the way down, spend a few nights, wherever. But uh, <laughs> I think there might be a bus or a trailer going down. I'll see. I'll play it by ear. <laughs> I like that. Oh, the other thing I was, I was interested about, you recently did one with, um, oh, what is that? It's, it's like a, a bat, but you, you charred it, um, trying that out. What was that oh, called? Oh, the Hurley. So Hurley. That's, uh, that's, no, I don't have any around me right now, but uh, a Hurley is basically a stick of ash um, that's used to play Ireland, one of Ireland's national sports, hurling. I don't play it well myself, but uh, my siblings do. Um, now, I've always been charring tool handles, um, and I usually use ash just because it's abundantly available. 
And these hurleys are also made out of ash because, you know, it's shock resistant, it's flexible, it's perfect for this instrument. Uh, so I always thought if you can share these ash handles, why not try char um, a hurley? Now, I did think it would make it really brittle and crack, but held up fairly well. I threw a video up of me making it and it was sold the very next day for three times what I paid for the hurling stick. So it was fun. <laughs> Yeah, it made me want to go out and look into the, the sport because I didn't, uh, haven't heard of that before. Brilliant. I'm doing Ireland a service. <laughs> Although I'm sure my wife has because she's more of the, uh, the world traveler minded than I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, when, when you talk about uh, using ash for um, handles and things like that, um, over here, we kind of look down on an ash handle as that's the cheaper one. Okay. Um, as in, uh, because we have hickory. And uh, I, I'm interested, have you tried any using hickory for things like that? I haven't. And uh, the reason being is because uh, I use all locally sourced hardwood. Yeah. Well, I use softwoods that's been imported from wherever, but um, in all my handles, I use wood that I've sourced from local sawmills or sometimes I've felled trees myself and let them dry. Uh, I would like to try hickory someday, and all the comments on any videos where I make a handle are, use hickory, use hickory, use hickory. <laughs> um, but I kind of like the idea of using a wood that's been grown yeah. half a kilometer over the road instead of, you know, the other side of the planet. Yeah. planet. No, it's, I, I love making a project and being able to take someone and say, you know, I can take you to the stump where this tree grew. Exactly. Yeah. And have a whole story to the project. And as much as people like hickory, honestly, in the actual function of it, I haven't really felt that much. I mean, there's a little bit less vibration to it if you're hitting it, but it's it's a pain to work with, though. Ash is much easier really? to work with. Okay, that's um, good to know. Yeah, hickory is is very stringy and it dulls tools instantly because it has a lot wow. more silica in it. The only experience I have of using it uh, is to cut off um, hickory handles that have come from other axes and the likes of it. <laughs> yeah. So, what, do we have any questions so far, babe? Uh, yes. Let's see. Daniel Bohr asked a question for Owen. What are you planning to do with the 12 by 12 oak beams from the video recently? Okay. Um, I think that was a bit kind of sacrilegious what was done with them beams. Uh, so, in Ireland, oak um, trees that grow that long and that wide are they're hard to come by, and you can't cut them down because they're all protected. So you can only get beams like that if a tree either dies, blows over on its own accord, or is too close to a building that was built before the tree was planted, or built, yeah, yeah, built before the tree was planted, uh, that it's indeed, that it is a threat to the building. So it's very hard to come by oak beams like that. Now with the amount of oak that was felled for that project, um, you could have built one, maybe two timber frame houses, which would have been a fantastic project. Instead, all of those 12 inch by 12 inch beams were taken to some millionaire's property nearby and laid down along the perimeter of a garden. There must have been oh. 10, 15,000 euro worth of oak spent just to line the perimeter of a garden. I think it was a shame, but sure, look, wood goes to the highest bidder at the end of the day, so that's oh. the way it goes. Yeah. Now, I had, I've been trying to, I have a workbench that I want to make. It's my dream bench, and it's to have a full slab top out of white oak that oh. is quarter sawn, so a solid monolithic piece, quarter sawn. Well, if I want 24 inches, that means the tree has to be probably around 50 inches in diameter. Wow, yeah. Um, but, and then have six inches thick slab top. And so for several years, I was looking for the tree that I could cut down to make the bench. And uh, I finally found one about six hours away. And uh, the uh, local sawyer there was um, cut it, milled it, and it's all sitting out beside the house drying. So I got to wait two or three more years for it to fully air dry. But, uh, How are you drying it so that it doesn't crack? Like any time uh, I've seen a, a large piece of oak like that dry, it, there's usually a massive crack somewhere along yeah. a piece like that. Well, it's it's just doing it as slowly as possible. Um, I'm it's in the shade, so there's no sun directly hitting it, and uh, it is uh, fully sealed on the ends, and I regularly go out and reseal it and just wow. doing it as, as long as possible. So I, I, I would like it to take two to three years um, to, to slowly dry it rather than having anything speed it up. 
and you're going to flatten that by hand because that that thing wouldn't feed through a machine at least not around here anyway Maybe yeah no it, it all yeah it's all hand <laughs> that's that the number eight to work well i was i had the the full slab six inches thick um but i i was it ended up being like 40 48 49 inches wide and um, I wanted to cut it down the middle through the pith and take the two halves of it and, and stack them. Um, and I used a, a circular saw to start cutting down through half of it, and I was planning on rolling it over and cutting it halfway. Well, I got halfway through the board and it burnt out my circular saw. So I had to go get a better worm drive circular saw, and I burnt that one out. <laughs> Got to get back to the old hand tools. They yeah, so out. then I got out the handsaw and... <laughs> these bad boys. So what questions we got, babe? Uh, so I'm just pulling them out in the order they're coming through. So okay. Malcolm asked, what is the purpose of a Stanley number six? Ah, yeah. How Do you get a lot of Stanleys over there or are they harder to come by? They seem to be a lot harder to come by than they are in America. Like you for that, like tool meets and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you, they seem to be abundantly available. The majority of my Stanley planes were actually imported from America. So sorry about that, but we yeah. pay a lot more for them than you do. Yeah. No, it's in interesting because I know of a guy who actually, um, his whole business is he goes back and forth between the UK and the US and he buys a lot of um, wooden and brass planes and things of the nature uh, from all over the UK brings them back to the US and upsells them really? and then he brings wow. Stanley things from the US to the UK yeah. and sells those interesting he must put me in touch with that guy sounds like he'd bankrupt me <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know of a whole lot in Ireland I, I, I know of a few places in the UK and nothing up in Scotland but to get back to the question, the number six, it is kind of the middle child of hand planes, isn't it? Like you've got the number five um, and then, you know, that's your typical jet plane. And then you, you use that for kind of general purpose. But then you've got your larger jointer planes, your triplanes, the number seven and the eight. Um, it is a weird, it is a weird one. I have one, but I, I barely ever use it. Yeah, I found that to be the, the case is either it's something someone absolutely loves or you just don't use it very much. Because I didn't say... My six, my six is the second least used out of my standard planes. The first is the, the four and a quarter. I almost never use really? the four and a quarter. I love that guy. Oh. No, I kind of use it as a scrub plane on large kind of beams when I'm timber uh, framing. Oh. Yeah. No, I, I don't use the six that much, but I, I, every time I mention the six that I don't use it, I get all sorts of comments saying, oh, I use mine all the time. Apparently some people like it. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite plane? Oh, it's got to be the number five. I had a number five for ages, and then I went and got a bedrock, so a 605. It's my main fella at the minute. Mm. You know, I don't have any bedrocks in my standard use pile. Really? Yeah. I, I think they are a bit overrated. They, they, like, supposedly you get less chatter from them, but I haven't found that to be any different, to be honest. Um, you can just adjust the frog without taking the whole thing apart, which... I've yeah. probably done twice since I got the plane. So. I think most of the yeah, reason I just, why I don't have them is I ended up, I usually end up selling them because okay. I can sell one and buy two other planes. <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, I've kind of been slowly shedding planes as well. There was one stage I think I had like 50 or 60 planes. I think I'm hovering around 40 now, which is a nicer number to be at. <laughs> so what, uh, what is your favorite tool in the shop? Oh, that's, that's a very, very difficult question. It's one I get asked the whole time. I don't think I could honestly come up with an honest answer because one tool is useless on its own. You need a myriad of different tools to do any single project, you know? Um, normally, once I restore a tool, I'll obsess over it for a while. Like, my most recent tool restoration was this fella back here, an old dovetail saw. Once I had this fella restored, uh, I was going out of the way just to cut dovetails just because I liked using it so much. <laughs> What is it now? Uh, it's a uh, Cowell and Chapman um, from Newcastle. And it's just a nice old vintage pistol grip dovetail saw. So for a while, that was my favorite tool. Uh, at the minute, I'm restoring a cast iron kettle. And once that's done, that'll be my new obsession. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's forever changing. I don't think you can honestly have a favorite tool. Yeah, yeah. 
I, my favorite answer to that question is it's the one that's currently in my hand at the moment. There you go. <laughs> in summary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's, what's the next question, babe? All right. Um, this question is for Owen. Ethan asks, will we see any Japanese chisels set up in use? I don't think so for a while, to be honest. I, um, I don't think I, th I have any particular use. I think um, down the line I might expo explore one of those. Do you ever see those videos? Um, they're usually using a dark wood and a white wood to do some very intricate sliding dovetail joint or something like that. I can see myself doing that, but at least not for another few years. So maybe in the, in the far future, I might invest in a nice set of Japanese chisels. Uh, but I think I'd probably explore some Japanese hand planes before I go down that route. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about doing the, the full Japanese experience and working on the floor? And... Uh, I don't think so. I think I prefer the, the style of Western carpentry, to be honest. But um, who knows? Again, I kind of go down rabbit holes that I, that I don't expect to find myself down. So yeah. if, if I do, you'll be the first to know. Have you gotten into turning? Uh, recently, I've been doing a lot. I did a lot of um, pole aid turning at the minute. Let me show you here. Um, I've been trying to make a replica of this um, Urkel chair. Uh, so I've been turning all the different components and I was doing it all on the pole aid because I didn't have a power lathe. Uh, a few pieces here I need to finish and uh, wherever else I have the seat somewhere. Uh, working on the seat just before the stream actually. But um, because I was doing so much pole aid turning, I, um, I was kind of looking at lathes online on our done deal. Uh, and I saw this old cast iron lathe that was powered with a motor, so I bought it and I'm going to convert it eventually to run off a treadle powering a flywheel. So I definitely think I'll be doing a lot more turning. I do a lot of kind of exhibitions, traditional craft fairs and stuff like that, and I think it'd be very cool to have a big fancy treadle lathe going. They tend to draw a crowd. Yeah. I actually have the, the same thing. I bought a, uh, an old craftsman um, offset and so it's it's basically a steel bar with a headstock and a tailstock and the headstock has um, v-belt pulleys on it and it's intended to have a motor mounted off with a v-belt connected and i just want to mount the whole thing and put a flywheel underneath and that sounds exactly like what i've got that'd be a lot of fun yeah <laughs> my problem is i don't have any place to put it how, mu how much space yeah, do you have that's... where you're at sorry how, how much space do you have where you're at how big is your shop uh, well, I wouldn't even call it a shop. It is my uh, parents' garage that I um, invaded, and uh, they are uh, a bit of a mess the minute, usually is. Um, yeah, but when they saw I was kind of doing, getting a bit of success online, they didn't seem to bother it too much. <laughs> and then kind of other places freed up. I'm now working out of my grandfather's shed as well. There's a workshop near where I live. There's another one somewhere. So uh, I don't have any space of my own, which could be a problem if I fall out with certain people. But... Um, <laughs> I'm managing at the minute with uh, pretty confined space. I love I'm it. saving up to buy land at some point and have my own shed. That's the long-term plan. So mm -hmm. we're struggling. <laughs> what else we got, babe? All right. So the questions for both of you. Um, Drop asked, what are your guys' most expensive projects you've done? Ooh. Most expensive as in, in time or money? Let's go money. That's usually more interesting. Yeah. Uh, I honestly don't think I've done any insanely expensive projects, to be honest. Um, especially when you're doing everything yourself, things tend to be fairly cheap. Yeah. Going back during lockdown, there was um, when all the pubs were closed in Ireland, um, a good few of like, us local lads about my own age pooled our money and we built a pub. And that was that cost us about, I think, 1,200 euro. Uh, collectively, that was probably the most expensive thing I've done for myself. I've done timber framing jobs for other people that have cost a lot more, but you know, I don't get to know how much those things cost. <laughs> I was thinking my, my dining room table, I probably have about $500 into that. Restoring the barn's treadle lathe, uh, I, that was probably about $700 total. But most of the things I either trade with other people, like a lot of the expensive things I bought, the, the Stanley 51, you know, normally this is going to cost you six, seven hundred dollars or more. Um, and I traded several tools uh, for that. 
Um, and most of my expensive things I've, I've traded other things for. Do you have the 52 to go along with it? No, I don't. Maybe someday. Someday. <laughs> I haven't found someone who will trade me for that yet. <laughs> How much will uh, the, the two of them cost over there? I think to get one in Ireland, it cost you the bones of, uh, I think, 2,400 euros. Um, actually, I just saw a set sell on eBay. This would have been three or four days ago for $4,500. What? Okay, then my number is very much off. It's gone up since. At at uh, at tool sales, they're usually somewhere around eighteen to two thousand. Okay, was this just a mint condition? Yeah, usually? it was. It was beautiful condition, um, and it's eBay. Everything costs more on eBay. Okay, um, so you're yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same here. And then you got to pay a customs duty once it arrives to Ireland, on top of the expensive delivery. Yeah. yeah. So by the and gets from America to here. It's costing me twice what it's costing you. Yeah, in, I mean, in the U.S., um, in the in the Midwest, it's relatively cheap to buy tools because there's an abundance here. Um, if you go out to the East Coast, there are just as many tools available, but there's more money out there, and so things cost a little bit more. Down south, there are it's very hard to find them, and so they cost more. But then you go out on the West Coast, and there's very little out there. And people have more money, and so they're willing to spend a lot more on the same tools. And so whatever is online sells at whatever their price is. Um, so you'll see a lot of people in the Midwest selling things online, and they end up going to places where they're willing to spend the money on it. Sounds like you're in a nice sweet spot anyway in regards yeah. to buying tools. Well, it's, uh, historically, it's an interesting setup because... Everyone, if you wanted to work with tools and you're on a farm, you had hand tools until the industrial revolution and power tools started to come out. Well, on the East Coast, power tools started to come out before World War II, but they hadn't made it into the Midwest yet. And so because of that, during World War II, a lot of the tools were sold off in scrap drives. Oh, wow. And gotcha. because they, they already had power tools they didn't need. Well, in the Midwest, they still needed the hand tools because that's what they were still using. And then after uh, World War II, all of these hand tools were then replaced with power tools, but they weren't destroyed. They were just in grandpa's barn. And so you regularly have these treasure troves of someone having thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of tools in grandpa's barn um, that you find in the Midwest. And the family just wants to get rid of them. They don't, they don't care what the price is. They just want to get the tools out of the barn because they're going to sell the property. And we have a, quite a bit of that. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, a little different like. from uh, from uh, from over where you're at. <laughs> a big problem we have here as well, if tools were left in, I suppose, you call them barns, we call them sheds. Um, Ireland has very high moisture everywhere, so everything rusts here. It's it's bad, but uh, yeah. So anything that is left for a long while mm -hmm. needs an amount of work, and anything that's like wooden hand plane or anything like that, woodworm has got to that long before you do. Yeah. Uh, the Midwest is pretty good about the moisture-wise in comparison. And especially half the year, it's the winter here, and we have 0% humidity in the winter. So, uh -oh. What's next, babe? Um, Steve, if you answered some of this earlier, I apologize because I had to sneak in late. Um, Steve August asks, I'd love to see a collaborative project between the two of you. Have you discussed this possibility, and if so, any ideas? We haven't yet, but yeah, we should. Yeah, it'd be interesting. You know, given that we're on opposite ends of the planet, it'd have to be something small and mailable unless we were to meet up at some point. Well, I don't know, babe. Could we uh, go over to Ireland? I don't uh, know if I could twist, twist your arm. My for that. arm. They can't see me. Hold my arm up. <laughs> <laughs> we got a little redhead that needs to come see some yeah. other. <laughs> I don't know. What could we do? It would be uh, make something to do it back and forth or... Carving or something. If I were to do a box or something and then send it over and you... Uh, or we could make some... two versions of the same thing and just make them on opposite yeah, sides. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to think. If anyone in the audience make, has make an idea, a flute. post them in. I don't know. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, You should make a hurley. The IRA, you'd be the first man in America to make a hurley. <laughs> I should. Send me some measurements. Well, maybe we, maybe we could do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is it Normally legal to make it out of hickory? 
oh that'd be cool i'd have always wondered if um yeah hickory has similar prod- like characteristics that would make it a suitable hurley is it shock resistant i'm assuming it's flexible i mean if it's a good axe handle right yeah it's a little bit more flexible and it's a little bit more shock reservant than than hickory hey. than, than ash what the hurleys is you can't just use a, a plank cut from the trunk it has to be Rhythm. um where the kind of trunk curves into the roots oh you get me yeah yeah so you'd, it'd be kind of an ordeal to cut um, a, a length of hickory like that wouldn't it yeah or bodark Ooh, bodark could be interesting you ever played yeah. with osage orange that's yeah, a different He's from different woods all over the world. That could be the project for me. <laughs> What's next, babe? Um, sorry, hang on. I'm doing this and trying not to sneeze. Uh, Clockman 45 asks, how do you sharpen a dovetail saw? They cast so much. How do you sharpen ca- a dovetail saw that casts too much? It says... I'm just copying. They uh-huh. cast so much. As it, it casts to the side in the direction you don't want it to? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. I don't know. I'm copying and pasting. Unless he's talking about cast steel, but that's not something you would make a dovetail saw yeah. out of. Yeah, I don't know. It's just the tenon saw. I know if, you, if, you, if you're carving one way to the side, you can take a file or a stone to one base of the teeth and kind of steer it right. But um, no, I think we're going to have to move on from that one. Yeah, send us some clarification on that. <clears throat> What's next? Um, hang on one second. Invictus S. The longest plane I own is a number six, and it sees use in every almost in almost every project. Would it be better to invest in a seven or an eight? And is there a substantial weight difference between the three? Thank you. What's your thought on that? Well, I think it really depends what you're doing. Unless you're flattening a huge tabletops or jointing really long boards, you'd probably get away with a six, wouldn't you? Like, I know a fella who makes, um, he's got a full collection of Stanley Planes. As far as I know, he's one of two full collections in Ireland of one to eight. Um, but uh, he religiously uses the number six to flatten all of his coffee tables. Um, so, no, I think. Um, if it's working for you, keep going. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the difference, I would say, yeah, they do kind of tend to. You do feel the difference as you go up. Like even from using the number seven to the number eight, there's a lot more. You feel it in your arms with any prolonged use. But I think the number seven would be my favorite plane for doing flattening and jointing work. Uh, I uh, I like to tell people <clears throat> you don't need all the planes. Each plane oh, just makes things a little bit easier for one particular application or another. And so, do you need it? No. But we are working with tools that we need. So, yes, you need them all. <laughs> when you're starting off, I think a lot of people go down the kind of the route of, okay, I'm going to get all of them. I'm going to get number, they probably start with the number four or five, and then they kind of work their way up and then start working down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can be a dangerous um, Thing to do because I've done that. I have the number two through eight, um, and I would say I use the five like ninety percent of the time, um, and then the other five percent are shared between the number four and the number seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an interesting thing that was pointed out to me a while ago is that the main planes, one through eight, all weigh that much in pounds. Wow! The one I never knew that uh, they give or take half a pound but they'll all be rounded to that poundage so if you're ever wondering you know do i really need an eight that's two more pounds than a six and that adds up fast you you really feel that depends you're looking to build muscle and maybe work your way up yeah uh, good okay so back to the sharpening the dovetail saw they're just asking how you sharpen a dovetail stall because they cost so much. Ah. Oh. Um. Exactly the same as any other rip saw, just littler. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, I suppose you'd, you'd remove it from the backing and the handle first. See, I don't take I don't mine get... out. 
Really? But I have a, a saw vise that holds it tight up above. Those are very hard to come by in Ireland. I have seen one saw vice in Ireland ever, and the fellow wouldn't sell it to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's what I do. And I think kind of taking the whole tool apart is kind of a nice, um, mm. you know, maintenance experience. Do you yeah. get me? Yeah, especially with a back saw, it's, it's, there, there's tuning to it. it. It's not something that's just a one piece. You, you have to understand how they all work together and they all function and fit together. Yeah, I think it was your video actually I watched before I tackled this fella. So thank you. Yeah. No, I was, I was looking at it from this one because this is also this is a Sheffield, um, but this one is a uh, ooh, Robert Sorby. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, I love this. I'd one. never. I couldn't find too much information on them online as well. Cowell and Chapman. No. Yeah. Well, they came from the, the period in Sheffield where you had all sorts of people who had a shop and it was just one guy making one type of saw and he sold that saw. And two houses down, there was another guy who made the exact same thing, but they were all sold as Sheffield saws. They just each were a different maker making that saw. Yeah. God, wouldn't it be great to go back and have a look? Just Oh, yeah. Uh We'll never have tool production like that ever again. Yeah. No, it's a, yeah. <laughs> I would love to go back to some of those shops and just be a fly on the wall watching it for a while. Yeah. I wonder where all the machines and the tools that were used in them shops are now. Well, there's, um, um, oh, where was the, the, the town we went to? Williamsburg. Williamsburg. Um, they have uh, the Williamsburg, the, the cabinet shop there. And uh, that is fascinating because it's, it's a fully functioning cabinet shop working just like it was back in the day, wearing the exact same clothes. The wow. clothes were even knit and made on site in the town from local sources. And Ooh. all of the tools were made from local trees and pieces came around. The hardware was made from the black shop in the town. And everything is made as close to reality as it could and the whole reason they do it is not to just demonstrate it but to learn it and so they actually grab a piece of furniture made at that shop in the time period and they deconstruct it and then they rebuild it as best they can with the tools they have in the situation and learn how it was done and it's absolutely fascinating to to go and do that have they you ever heard of uh... Edelon Castle project in France. They're doing something similar. With oh that. yeah, yeah. No, that, to check that out. That one's on my list to to go and spend a while shooting a video there. Yeah, you'd, you'd spend a week watching them carpenters timber frame whatever it is they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially seeing some of the like the, the temporary things that they build. You know, building a stone arch is building the the whole timber frame to hold the stone arch while they build it, and knowing that it's just temporary, but building it still with the. Um, with the, the structure in mind, that's yeah. Uh, and building a tradition, like, would it be to just grab a piece of plywood and whatever two by fours or four by twos, um, and just get that curve in maybe half a day? Whereas these guys are doing, they're building there. Yeah. Would traditionally using more than ten the tree. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? Yeah. Now, what you I ever, found was very. You I, ever had a chance to use a pit saw? No, I've only ever seen one in Ireland, and it was hanging up in a shed. Um, I know a fella whose father was a carriage maker. Um, he owned it, and it was just hanging up rusty, because like I said, everything rusts in Ireland. And that was last summer. And I said to him, uh, if, if some point down the line there's a show where I can restore that and give a demonstration, would you let me? And he said yes. So I, I need to get back to him at some point and get that fella cleaned, sharpened. going to set up two things of scaffolding and get a log between us and, you know, get an underdog and an overdog and get to work. Mm. Should we go over and give them I a was just thinking, like, <laughs> when can we buy the ticket? That would be fun. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, let me know if you ever want to do that. Maybe we might be able to work something like that in a schedule. That would be fun. Sarah doesn't need to work. She can quit the job. Let's just go. <laughs> um, you ready for the next question? Yeah, what you got? Okay. Dennis Miko asks, what hardwood is locally available in Ireland? Okay. 
At the minute, we have a ton of ash available. If anyone watches my videos, I'd say there's seldom a video goes by where I don't mention it, just because there's a lot of uh, what is it? ash dieback happening at the minute. So a lot of trees that are dying are just being felled. And, you know, ash, if it's left out to rot for even one winter, the wood looks disgusting. It's kind of gone beyond use just because it's so porous. So there's a lot of that available if you're quick to get it. Um, we have a lot of beech here as well. A uh, good bit of oak as well, but again, that's slightly harder to come by. Uh, birch, a uh, bit of cherry as well. Yeah, no, there's lots of uh, lots of hardwoods available at the minute. Um, so at some point, I'm going to own a sawmill and be a very happy man. But it would be unusual. Go back 200 years, and Ireland's landscape was absolutely barren of trees because we burnt pretty much anything we could, we could because we needed it for fuel. We needed the land for agriculture. But if you go back another couple of thousand years, Ireland would have been just cloaked entirely in oak forest so yeah there's a lot of hardwoods available at the minute to answer your question now that, i think that's another interesting comparison you're, you're probably going to get a lot of people from the u.s because here ash is kind of seen as the the, the cheap wood because Are it you? doesn't have the color and the texture of oak and oak is readily available it's it's everywhere and it <laughs> it's um, a little less durable than hickory. And so it's kind of like, it's that in-between wood that no one really wants to use. Interesting. Um, so I yeah. think in Ireland, we do variation for it. There's a lot of folklore surrounding trees mm. and stuff like that. But yeah, we, if you tell someone something's made out of ash, they kind of go a bit, you know, they, they like it. Huh. Interesting how it looks at wood differently. Yeah. Well, especially in the Midwest, trees are just everywhere and people are always just, cutting them down just because the I don't like the look of the tree and it'll, wow. it'll get cut up into 18 inch segments and put out on the road and thrown away wow. and, uh, have you much old growth left over there have what old growth forests um, not in the Midwest but if you go up into northern Wisconsin northern Michigan there's a lot of virgin forests that have never been touched and so there's, a, there's actually a, a forest I used to go to in Michigan called uh, Hartwick Pines. And they have uh, uh, thousand year old pine trees that wow. were, you know, that's just, have, that's, that's where they've always been. <laughs> no one's ever cut them down. <laughs> hey, Ireland has absolutely no old growth forest left. We cut down every single square inch. Hmm. And it's a shame, go to museums, you can see these dugout canoes, like 27 feet long, of um, oak that they, you know, hacked out with an ads to make a boat. Can you imagine, like, what a tree like that must have looked like once upon a time? Hmm. Yeah, I was doing a restoration project on a house in Wisconsin, uh, and it was built about 200 years ago. And uh, it was built from everything on the property. All the timber came from the property. All of the, the bricks actually came from the property. The stonework came from the property. And the frost board on it so going up the house you have the frost board the soffit and then the fascia connecting to the roof the frost board uh, was 20 inches tall by an inch thick and so we went and got wood to replace it because it was it was starting to, to rot out uh, but when we actually got up there and scraped the paint off it we found out the board was a solid piece of cedar without wow. a knot in it 20 inches by one inch by 20 feet long and that whole wow. board didn't have a single knot in it. And they had, uh, it would have been eight of those boards all the way around the house because it was 40 by 40. That's um, they, they cut that from the trees that grew on the property. And uh, <laughs> yeah, things grew differently back then. That have been old growth stuff, surely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wow. No, we'll never get a tree like that over here, ever. Yeah, you could still find them, but you'd have to you'd have to go looking for them. They don't. The... I think if you do, I think trees like that should be left alone. You know, for a woodworker, I do like tree well, conservation. There are actually um, quite a few forests that are set aside just for harvesting old growth, um, like uh, um, the the USS Constitution. Um, the they actually have a forest in Ohio that is just set aside to slowly replace everything out of the ship. And wow. it's big enough that as they mill the lumber out of the forest and the, the time it takes to mill all of the lumber to rebuild the ship, it will have all regrown in the forest. And so the whole forest is just set aside to be the source to constantly rebuild the ship. 
That's interesting. Do you know how big that forest is? How big does a forest does the kind? How big a forest um, does the? I looked at it on the map, and I want to say it was like two square miles. Okay, it's huge. not that big, but ah, for our... massive. For a forest. <laughs> I I have one I run <clears throat> run at just down the street. That's four square miles of, of state park forest, and there's yeah, forest like that all around us. Yeah, no, I think the size difference is another big difference between the yeah between Ireland. We've got like I think six hours you can drive the full length of the country. It's probably <laughs> trip. To what do we got next, babe? Um, we actually have a super chat. Ah, what we got um, from Idle Hands Workshop. Oh, I think it was these. Um, for the question is for Owen: Is there a tool that is there a tool that is specific to Ireland that we wouldn't see here in the states? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know. Do you guys have bogs in in the states? Like um, have what? Like bogs of peat. Yeah. Um, okay. Not as much in the Midwest, but out on the West Coast and some places on the East Coast. Okay. Well, um, maybe you would have this tool then, but a kind of a tool that would be very famously Irish would be the, the Schlane or the Schlan, wherever you want to pronounce it. It's basically, it looks kind of like a shovel, except uh, it's kind of a hybrid between a shovel and a corner chisel, do you know? Um, let me grab a corner chisel. Um, so it's essentially something that looks kind of like this, right? Uh -huh. That you'd you drive down into turf when you're cutting it, um, into peat to make sods of turf to fuel fires. So that's kind of it's not a woodworking tool, but uh, I suppose it would be a kind of iconically Irish tool. Yeah, bogs are they're around, but they're not ubiquitous enough to be seen as a resource. Okay, because it would be like there there is a bog in that state, but it's not. Uh, it's not enough that you you could build something around. That's fascinating. I, I want to see something like that. That's, that'd be interesting. Yeah, well, like I'm saying, a few hundred years ago, there was very little wood in Ireland, so we had to cut into our boglands to fuel fires, to heat homes, and to cook food. Huh. Now, as we have um, um, bog oak, which is you know oak that has sunk hundreds of years ago and has been at the bottom of a lake or a bog for. Um, time and that's fascinating stuff to work with. Um, really, I've never worked with it, but I'm offered it the whole time. I must, uh, I must go collect some. Actually, I think it would make interesting tool handles. Yeah. I hear it's very brittle. Yeah, um, it, it's not a very durable wood, but it is really beautiful and very, very expensive. It's, you know, oak around here is eh, three to four dollars a board foot, um, but bog oak might be forty to fifty dollars a board foot. Well, wow. um, so it's. it's a, uh, it's interesting. You wouldn't believe how much bog oak gets just burnt in Ireland. I really? was visiting a summer, and he had kind of a what looked to be like a kind of a carved sphere-looking object. Um, and I asked him where he got it, and he said he was visiting an old relative one time, and she had a pile of bog, bog oak ready to shove into the fire. And he spotted it, and he picked it out, and uh, he noticed kind of like hewing marks on it from what would have been a bronze axe once upon a time. And he was like, oh, I'm not going to let you burn that. So he just took it away. I thought it was fascinating. Like, can you imagine how, like, this is an artifact. This was, someone was trying to sculpt something at one time. Couldn't tell you what it was or what it was trying to be. But uh, you know what I mean? Like yeah. how much stuff was just chucked in a fire just to fuel a full home at one one time. Blows huh. my mind. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'll tell you what, you send me some bog oak and I'll send you some hickory and we'll, uh, we'll call it even. <laughs> Got enough time for one more? Yeah. Sure. It's 549, so are we going to six or no? Yeah. Okay. Let's take another one. I was just telling the chat that we probably aren't going to get to all the questions I've pulled out. Let's do one more fun one. A fun one? Oh, whatever. <laughs> one lucky one. One lucky one. Okay, I'm going to go with this one because I think a lot of people would like it. It's the most recent, but I think it'd be interesting. Um, James Crandall asked, I'm curious on what Owen thinks of other UK woodworkers like Paul Sellers or Richard McGuire. Uh, I have a lot of admiration for them. I think Paul Sellers is probably one of my biggest inspirations for getting into woodworking. Um, kind of a short answer, but uh, no, I have a lot of admiration for anyone keeping the traditional crafts alive. Yeah, I, don't, I think a lot of us have, are the next generation after to Paul, and he has Particularly, he has taught so many people and so many uh, has given so much to the community. It's yeah, 
How can you not love him? <laughs> one more? Yeah, one more quick one. There's like six questions, and now I'm <laughs> picky. Um, okay. Did you guys talk about your most enjoyable project you've ever done? Well, that's a hard one. I think for me, it was definitely the Kurok, you know, building a boat. It took me three months and it was just something to look forward to when I was finished working my job. I could come home and tip away at it and slowly started to, I don't know if anyone's made a boat, but it starts off as a frame and eventually it, it starts to look like a boat. And then, you know, it's, um, it's kind of my first big project as well. So the whole thing was exciting. And then once you actually get it on the water, um, there's a huge excitement. And then, you know, you have a boat you can use. I was taking friends out to sea. We were visited lighthouses. And then when winter came and it got too stormy, we took it to a lake and we were going on camping trips on it. So yeah, absolutely, my Kurok. Yeah, I think it is. It's usually the th the thing you put the most blood, sweat, and tears and time into. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if I could pick one project. I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind for me is the dining room table, just because I, I look at it every day and it, it's I, I love looking at that table. It's it, yeah, it's gorgeous. But. Uh, yeah, you never know. <laughs> cool. Well, on that note, I think we'll wrap it up. So thank you, Owen, for coming. Thanks for having me. We'll have, uh, we'll have to get together sometime and do something fun. Absolutely. I'll let you know if I'm ever over in the States. You let me know if you ever come in Europe. Will do. Cool. Well, I think on that note, we'll wrap it up. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Good luck. Uh, button. Okay. <laughs>